Projectability is our guide to the things that stick together in the universe, the structures of the universe, right? And I think that structure is a causal structure. So what we're ultimately interested in capturing is, is a causal structure of the world. And the kinds are precisely those features of the causal structure of the world that we're trying to uh, discern. All right, so welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Muhammad Ali Khalidi. He is Presidential Professor of Philosophy at, at CUNY Grad Center, and his work focuses primarily on the philosophy of science, cognitive science, social science, and, and also on the classical, classical Arabic Islamic philosophy. His books include, as editor, Medieval Islamic Philosophical Writings, Natural Categories and, and Human Kinds, uh, Cognitive Ontology, Taxonomic Practices in the Mind-Brain Science, and the one that we'll be talking about today is Element with Cambridge University Press, Natural Kinds. Uh, feel free to add, add anything. And also, he has a variety of articles on these, on these topics, but feel free to add anything. But with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Khalidi. Well, thank you so much for the interest. Awesome. So, yeah, so yeah, as I said, we're, we're going to be focusing on your on this book on, on natural kinds. It's, it's fairly short. It's an, it's an element with, with Cambridge elements and it's, it's open access as well. So anyone can, can check it out. I think you, you can also get, you can also get a hard copy. You can buy that if, if you prefer, but uh, yeah, it's really cool. And it's, and it's, it's not that long, but it, it packs in a fair amount of uh, information with a, I guess, somewhat opinionated introduction to, uh, to uh, natural kinds. Um, so yeah, when we think about natural kinds, like there's a, a few ways we might start going about trying to capture what that is, right? So there's uh, thinking about cases, you know, very stereotypical examples like elements, gold is a natural kind, maybe biological kinds, like maybe species or various genera and so on. Um, we might cite kind of certain helpful metaphors, like j carving nature out of joints, right? And or we might try to think about what, what do we have in mind roughly when we think about natural kinds, which is maybe something to do with these like non-arbitrary categories of nature. Um, is this a good starting point? H how would you go about introducing natural kinds, especially to those who are less familiar with the topic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, all, all of those are possible entryways, and they're all pretty good, at least pedagogically, or for, for someone who's unfamiliar with the whole uh, notion of natural kinds, which has become a, a bit of a philosophical term of art. People who haven't really done much philosophy may not be exposed to the term. And people who have done some philosophy might see it crop up in lots of different places. Uh, at least that's what I'm told. I mean, for me, it crops up in lots of different places because I'm sort of attuned to it. <laughs> but I think a lot of students tell me, oh, it keeps cropping up in epistemology and ethics and philosophy of science and metaphysics and so on. So, yeah, all those ways you mentioned, I think, are potentially good ways of uh, broaching the topic and motivating the question. I do think the examples way can sometimes lead us astray because, to paraphrase Wittgenstein, we're sometimes fed a narrow diet of examples in philosophy. And the ones you mentioned are the ones that really have had the disproportionate share of discussion and, and thrown about in conversation and in t in writing a lot, you know, uh, gold, water, tiger. And sometimes when we focus on certain kinds of paradigmatic examples, that can kind of lead us to theorize in a particular way. So there's a potential pitfall there. The, the metaphors also, I mean, the carving nature, that derives ultimately from Plato. And, you know, it's kind of a nice, catchy, colorful metaphor, but it, it also is misleading in certain ways. All metaphors, to some extent, are, you know, don't uh, capture exactly what we, what we want. And the, the carving metaphor, apart from being gruesome, there's something about sort of controlling nature in it that's maybe a bit reminiscent of the early scientific revolution and Francis Bacon and ideas that maybe would become a little bit leery of in, in the kind of modern age. Uh, but the, the, contra, the third thing that you said about arbitrary, I think maybe is, is a, a more literal and more principled way of approaching the, the discussion. You know, there are categories that seem purely arbitrary 
and there are others that seem more principled. So what's the difference between them? What's the difference between categories that don't really seem to be capturing anything about the world and categories that seem to be kind of glomming onto certain kinds of patterns in the world? Right. Okay, good. Yeah. And we'll, we'll definitely get into, get into some of that more deeply. I think could you, as a sort of brief overview, could you cover some of the broad views about natural kinds, in particular, like realism and conventionalism and uh, stuff like that? Yeah, maybe the big divide is between what's usually called realism on the one hand and conventionalism on the other. And I've actually become very wary of the the label conventionalism here. And I probably should have emphasized that more in the element. In the element, I think I did talk about, you know, conventionalism as more or less a a synonym for anti-realism about kinds. I think a less contentious way of putting it is just to talk about realism and anti-realism. The, re- the reason, and maybe I should say briefly why I think conventionalism is a little misleading. Uh, conventions can be the basis of kinds, I think, uh, especially in the social world. I mean, the social, if, if we think, now, uh, there, there are people who might say, well, there, there are no kinds in the social world. But I think increasingly philosophers have come to think that there's no real divide between the natural world and the social world, at least when it comes to finding kinds of things. There might be important differences in what kinds are like in the social world and what kinds are like in the biological or the chemical worlds and so on, or the domains of of chemistry and biology as opposed to the domains of, say, economics or political science or uh, something like that. But if you think in principle that there are kinds that you can discover kinds of things in the social world, many of those are based on conventions. I mean, convention is a very important element in the social world, and conventions depend on human attitudes and actions And these are part of the structure of the social world, the the scaffolding that results in real types of things, real types of social things. Now, I think people might say, oh, yes, yes, okay, we we understand that there there are conventions uh, in that sense that are the basis of kinds, but that's not what we meant. We meant conventions as being the basis of the distinction as opposed to be the ba- basis of the kind or something like that. But if the if convention is the base is at the basis of the kind, if conventions distinguish between, say, married persons and unmarried persons, then they're also the basis of making the distinction. So I do think that it's problematic to contrast realism with conventionalism when it comes to kinds uh, for that reason. So I think the first kind of divide is between realists and let's just call them anti-realists, right? And so you have on one hand people who think that there are kinds and our job is to discover them and to uh, find the categories that correspond to them. And there are others who say, no, all there are are categories, uh, things that pertain to our discourse. And let me just also kind of parenthetically say, I, I want to make a distinction between kinds and categories. And I think realists, even realists sometimes don't uh, make that distinction very consistently. Sometimes people talk about kinds and categories kind of interchangeably, but I would like to say that kinds are the things we're trying to discover in the world. And the categories are pertain to our discourse. So they're the concepts of the kinds. And ultimately, when we're trying to understand the world, make generalizations about it, predict, explain, and so on, what we're trying to do is to have our categories, in some sense, capture the kinds, that we want our categories to correspond to the kinds. So. Uh, realists think in those terms, the realists think that there are kinds and there are categories that attempt to capture them, that attempt to faithfully distinguish between the kinds. And anti-realists, on the other hand, think that all oh, there are, are categories. So I think that's the, the big divide. There, there are people who might consider themselves something like semi-realists or quasi-realists who say, look, it's not so simple. 
the human mind sort of co-conspires with nature to come up with the things for us to capture in the world. Uh, they are uh, things that are co-created by the mind and the world. Um, and I find that position, I think, a little hard to swallow because I guess I want to say, look, if there are those uh, human biases or human uh, tendencies that kind of determine what kinds we discover, why can't we somehow bracket them or get rid of we, we have all kinds of biases. And sometimes it seems as though we can detect those biases and transcend them. And if you say, well, no, th these are the kinds of things that are, you know, unavoidable that, that sort of somehow determine um, our thought and it can't, we can't uh, escape them, uh, a sort of Kantian position, right? That there's some, some unavoidable obstacle. Um, and I want to say, well, look, if, if these are things that we can't in principle transcend, we should just consider that reality, whatever it is that, that our best descriptions uh, capture. So I guess I, I think I have a hard time understanding how one can sort of uh, occupy this midway position between uh, realism about kinds and anti-realism, um, the, the, the position that says, well, there are no kinds out there, reality is unknowable, all we have is categories or something like that. Um, so I think that that's the broad, that's the kind of broad distinction. Within realism, I think there are lots of different positions and we can talk about some of them. I mean, the one that's been very prominent in a lot of recent philosophizing is essentialism. It's perhaps begun to fall out of favor in some quarters, especially maybe among philosophers of science. But I think essentialism is still pretty alive and well in some parts of metaphysics and, and other places as well. The Among realists who are not essentialists, I think a very popular theory that a lot of philosophers have adopted is the one that was put forward by the late philosopher of science, Richard Boyd. Who's a home, who thinks of kinds as homeostatic property clusters. Um, there are others who have a causal theory of kinds, and I, I think of myself as one of those that, that, that can be viewed as a closely related to Boyd's homeostatic property cluster theory, but is less restrictive about what sorts of causal configurations count as kinds. And then there are th those who just adopt a sort of a cluster theory who think of kinds as just clusters of properties without any further sort of metaphysical trappings to them. So I think those are, as I understand the field, the main positions in, 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 in the running nowadays. Yeah, fair, fair enough. That's, that's a good overview. I mean, what, what do you think about, I mean, if someone took, took kinds to be like, they might think that some kinds are like objective, but other kinds are a matter of convention or they take an anti this approach to that. I mean, could someone take a mixed view like that? What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that there's, just to go back, the in the social domain, it's, it's hard to think about conventions not playing a role because conventions actually are part of the, the structure of the social world. And so I just have come to find that talking about conventionalism or as conventions kind of partly determining uh, the nature of kinds or something like that, uh, somewhat problematic. I, I do think that, um, so I said that I, I think that kinds are ultimately grounded in causation and what we're trying to discover are causal patterns in the world. And the kinds are just the clusterings of causal properties that we find in the world. And what that implies is that um, we will find you know, some causal clusterings that are more interesting or important or relevant to our purposes than others. And so I think 
convention or human interest, if you like, can play a role in selecting which kinds we focus on or which kinds we zero in on. And I think that distinction or that kind of that position isn't often uh, clearly distinguished from a position that somehow thinks of conventions as constituting the kinds. I think of conventions or human interest as playing a role in selecting the kinds that we happen to focus on or give prominence to in our theories. But I, I, th I see that as a selection issue. I don't see that as a case of human interests or human conventions somehow creating the kinds. And I think that, you know, that that's not always heated in these discussions, but it's partly because I'm also a real pluralist about kinds. I'm a realist, but I think there are lots of kinds out there. And I think there are probably more kinds than we'll ever be able to discover. And I think in, in some domains, there's a lot of leeway over which causal, there's what the philosopher of science, Bill Wimsatt calls causal thickets, where Causation is very intricate, say, in the social world or the biological world and so on. And those are also cases, they tend to be cases where the causal relations are, you know, uh, not a kind of, or the, let's put it this way, the causal generalizations we make are not exceptionless. And so you have a lot of intervening causes and things that you know, might change causal relationships in those domains. And in those domains, I think we have sometimes quite a lot of leeway, which kinds of structures to privilege and which ones to focus on. And so I think in those domains, human interest can play a role in deciding which ones we're particularly inter interested in. So that's how I think of the role of, of convention or human interest in 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 determining not what kinds there are, but in determining which kinds of the many ones out there we happen to focus on. Good. Yeah, that's that's an important distinction for sure. Yeah. Like there's a difference between our conventions and, you know, interests and pragmatics and stuff. Deciding which kinds we attend to or investigate or talk about and so on. The difference between that and saying like, oh, our the pragmatic stuff actually decides which categories count as kinds, right? That that would be a different right. claim altogether. That would be a more anti-realist or maybe conventionalist uh, view. Um, yeah, across the board, right? I mean, just to uh, also sort of add to that, I do think there are categories that we employ in ordinary discourse, mm. but also sometimes in science that don't seem to be capturing kinds. They're not really isolating things that are causally integrated uh, in the way that we are interested in. So take something like psychiatric categories. I've come to think, and other people have argued this, that there's nothing really in common to all the uh, conditions that we call mental illness or, or psychiatric disorders, right? Psychiatric disorders are just different conditions, some of which hinder people's normal lives or their ability to function in society or their ability to hold jobs and so on. Uh, others don't particularly, others just mark them out as maybe a bit atypical and so on. It's a just sort of a grab bag of different conditions that don't really have all that much in common, apart from the fact that you know, in some sense, we think they tend to be amenable to treatment or should be clinically looked at or something like that. And so the, the category psychiatric disorder or mental illness, I don't think captures a kind. Uh, it captures things that have been sort of thrown together, if you like, by convention or by accidents of history or something like that. But that's not to say that individual conditions that we lump under this superordinate category, such as depression or autism or a body dysmorphic disorder, those conditions might be kinds in their own right, but the superordinate category doesn't really capture a kind. So I, I do think there are lots of categories out there that we employ that don't particularly capture a kind. But I do, th I, I also think that when we are interested in sort of systematically investigating the world and understanding it and explaining it and so on, 
we try to come up with categories that do capture kinds. Good, good. Hey, okay, so then a couple of points of like methodology then, like how, how important do you think that, you know, folk intuitions and concepts and like just everyday discourse that might involve terms like kinds and natural kinds, how, how important do you think that is for thinking about natural kinds? Because I, I could think on one hand that, you know, it should be relevant to fixing target for analysis. Like we're trying to get at what people are normally talking about when they employ this sort of talk. Um, but on the, other hand, on the other hand, maybe we should, you know, give more privilege to say scientists or philosophers of science, what they have in mind when they employ this sort of talk. Maybe we're more concerned with that or think that they're better getting at uh, the way things are. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, how, how, how do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think with a lot of philosophical investigations, uh, we should give a lot of weight to ordinary talk. And if we're interested in understanding free will or goodness or even maybe knowledge, there are lots of ordinary contexts where we employ that those terms where and those terms are playing an important role in our lives. And so if we give a philosophical account that is not at least responsive to that or gives you, you know, some analysis of free will that doesn't correspond to what anyone ever thought of, of uh, you, you know, using free will, uh, the term free will or I did this freely or something like that, then I think maybe we need a kind of a corrective. With kinds, I mean, there is some kind talk in ordinary discourse, but I'm not sure that you know, kinds, certainly natural kinds, is not something that really figures in our most of our common discourse. And I think that, I mean, just historically, the term really entered into philosophical discussion explicitly, natural kind in the 19th century. And Ian Hacking is, has shown that uh, really the first person to use the term seems to have been John Venn. And there's a kind of an interesting, I, I always find this a little weird and fascinating that then the first time he uses this term, this expression, natural kind, he attributes it to Mill. But now if you look at Mill's work, Mill never uses the expression natural kind, right? He sometimes says, well, he says kind quite a bit in a system of logic. And he says real kind, occasionally true kind once or twice but never says natural kind. So it's a bit of a term of art. And so I, and it's a term of art that people like Mill and Hewell first talked about in the 19th century in connection with scientific categorization and in connection with understanding what makes a good taxonomy, what makes a valid taxonomic system or what makes a good system of classification. You know, why was Linnaeus a system of classifying plants not that great? Oh, because it, it was, they, they would say it had, it wasn't a natural classification system or it didn't pick out kinds. So to some extent, the term itself is anchored really not so much in ordinary discourse you know, unlike terms like good or right or free will or something like that. And it, it pertains more to philosophers theorizing about science. So, I mean, I wouldn't give too much weight to intuitions or the way it's used or the way the, the term is used in, in ordinary discourse. And I'm, I'm generally kind of down on intuitions. <laughs> and I know we've become sensitized to this about in the last 20 or 30 years in philosophy, and rightly so, I think. I mean, I remember the first time I ever took a philosophy course, I was a physics major as an undergraduate, and I took a philosophy course with a very smart and very interesting teacher. And when he would sometimes refer to intuitions in argument, as an outsider to the field, I was always stunned by this. Like, how, how can we, you know, rest so much on intuitions? Now, I've... I think I've gotten a bit more of an appreciation for where intuitions are important and need to be given some weight in philosophical argumentation. But I, I would be very hesitant, and partly also because, I mean, the, the other thing we've become sensitized to is when philosophers cite intuitions, it's intuitions that tend to be not completely untutored and maybe 
in the in, under the influence of certain philosophical theories, and they maybe pertain to certain cultures or certain class backgrounds. You know, there's all been all this discussion in psychology about weird individuals, people who come from Western uh, educated, industrialized societies and so on. So I guess I'm, I'm a bit leery of putting too much weight on intuition, particularly in the context of talking about kinds or natural kinds. And I think the whole origin of the discussion really comes from reflecting on the sciences or reflecting on systematic inquiries into, into the world. Right. Interesting. I mean, I, I could also sort of see an argument for engaging in a bit of sort of, I don't know, conceptual engineering in a way, because if it turned out that, you know, our notion, even, even among philosophers and, 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 and scientists was a bit messy or didn't serve the kind of maybe scientific or inquiry related purposes we want for it maybe we could just well let's think about it this way maybe use natural kinds to try to capture these sorts of things and that might be maybe not capturing what we already had in mind but maybe more useful i could see an argument for that is that something you think much about it yeah not not enough to tell you the truth but yeah i think there is room for you know putting this within the framework of conceptual engineering. And I think people do that implicitly, even though they might not use those terms. I mean, in some sense, and I think a lot of people have acknowledged this recently, conceptual engineering has always been with us. It's always been a part of philosophy, even if we haven't talked about it in those terms. But yeah, I mean, if you think about the ways in which... um, Philosophers are attuned to how scientists determine whether certain kinds of taxonomic categories are valid or not, or discussions of construct validity in the sciences. A lot of that, I think, should be factored in when we're thinking about you know, how, what natural kinds are. So if we come up with a notion of natural kinds that is not responsive at all, to how scientists think about valid categories or good classification schemes, then I think we're probably barking up the wrong tree. So yeah, I I would factor those kinds of considerations in for sure. Uh, So if, for instance, our notion of natural kinds is so restrictive that it captures, you know, a sort of tiny, uh, small selection of categories in the sciences and rules all the others not to be capturing anything significant about the world or something like that, uh, then I think maybe we're in trouble. Now, maybe you could give some story for why those categories are somehow privileged. Not all scientific categories are created equal, uh, perhaps, but I think that the onus is on you, really, uh, if you come up with a notion of natural kinds that is very restrictive and says that, you know, there are vanishingly few kinds in the world. Uh, I think the onus is on you to try and uh, bolster that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely share that approach. And, and then another thing that comes up regarding methodology in the element is is the importance of science as a guide, or perhaps like the best guide we have for thinking about what kinds there are. Can you talk a bit about why you prefer this approach? Why, why is science so good in this regard yeah i mean i'm i'm conscious and wary of uh, charges of scientism and of somehow taking you know science as the last word on everything but what i you know the way i think about it is that science is just our you know organized epistemic enterprise And it's our best way, it seems, of understanding the nature of the world, the universe, including the social world. And so it seems to me that if we want to know science is going to be the kind of, at least is the first place we're going to look. So um, it seems to me that we should have a kind of predisposition to think that the categories that seem to be doing the uh, the most work in science, the ones that are most predictive, the ones that are most explanatory and so on, are the ones that are going to reveal what kinds of things there are uh, in the universe. You know, I, I think there are 
obviously other kinds of enterprises that are not, you know, primarily epistemic enterprises. You know, I don't think sports is really about finding out the truth. The law generally is not about finding out the truth, cooking, and so on. So now there are sciences that are related to those things. You can do the sociology of sports or the sociology of law or something like that. Uh, But those enterprises are great and fine and good, but I'm not sure that they're always aimed at, you know, understanding the nature of things and generalizing about things and so on. I mean, you know, writing novels and poetry or doing, you know, making films or even some kinds of disciplines like history, at least some parts of those enterprises are more about sort of singular events or singular uh, uh, you know, particulars as opposed to kind of trying to generalize or make some kinds of broad explanations or inductive inferences. So they're not particularly about trying to capture the kinds of things in the world. Uh, there are a lot of historians who are more interested in understanding some particular sequence of events or understanding some, you know, how some particular process unfolded as opposed to making uh, generalizations or um, finding out what kinds there are in the world or something like that. Do you think that natural kinds might come in, I mean, degrees of how much of a natural kind they are, maybe in degrees of naturalness, if you want to use that term? Like, I don't know, I could see someone saying something like, I don't know, the kinds you get, especially if you're using science as a guide, the kinds you get in, say, fundamental physics, like, I don't know, different sorts of particles or fields or whatever, those are more natural kinds than, say, I don't know, mothers you get in biology or the special sciences. I mean, what what, what do you think about this um, view? Yeah, yeah, I, I do think there are differences between domains. I mean, I think the domains that we investigate are different. I don't see any real sharp divides. I think there are some philosophers and some metaphysicians who want to say all the kinds you get are in physics and chemistry, maybe biochemistry. There's a book by Brian Ellis, Scientific Essentialism, which basically thinks that there are only kinds in physics and chemistry and maybe some kinds in biochemistry. And I, I'm not a fundamentalist like that, but I do think, and I, I think there are also continuities. I don't think there's a sharp divide between the chemical and the biological or the biological and the psychological or the psychological and the social and so on. So I think that uh, there is a certain kind of continuity, but I do think having said that, there are some domains where, yeah, the the causality is clearer, it's less intricate, there are uh, fewer intervening causes. And so the generalizations we can make are cleaner and more strict. So that is one dimension along which kinds differ. There are some kinds where you know the, the properties cluster together, as it were, much more tightly. And there are other kinds where you've got a loose clustering of properties. It's not so, uh, it's not so tight. So I think there are differences that way, and I think there are certain ways in which uh, different dimensions along which you could distinguish kinds. You know, for instance, another dimension, pretty simple one, and here the degree is maybe kind of easier to assess uh, how prevalent they are in the universe. You know, certain kinds of physical and chemical kinds presumably are spread all over the universe. Biological kinds are restricted uh, to maybe to one planet for we know for sure, maybe others we don't know, and so on. So social kinds, who knows? I mean, if there are biological kinds, maybe there are social kinds. Can there be social kinds without biological kinds? Interesting question. I'm not sure. You know, you might have certain kinds of social groups that are not biologically based, at least in principle. Uh, It's an interesting question. But so, yeah, so I think there are various dimensions or degrees along which kinds might vary. But I don't think there are these strict discontinuities. And I think philosophers have been sort of biased to look for kinds in certain places, but not others. I I do think that we have these patterns of causal 
you know, these, these causal patterns, uh, there are, there is causal structure to the world outside of physics and chemistry. And I think that's what we're trying to capture when we're trying to determine what the, what the kinds are. Right. Sure. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds good. And then another thing that comes up when regarding natural kinds, you sort of mentioned this already in, in, in saying that you're kind of pluralist about, about kinds, but, um, yeah, something that comes up is, well, how, how sparse are the kinds, right? Are there many, maybe yeah. millions or even maybe infinitely many, <laughs> or are there relatively few? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, well, you know, even yeah. if you restrict, I mean, I think one thing that we haven't fully realized is that even if we restrict ourselves to say, you know, physics and chemistry, I mean, if you think of chemical compounds, um, we, we just don't know. I mean, I, I tried when I was writing this element, I tried to see if anyone has kind of estimated how many chemical compounds mm -hmm. there are uh, or how many chemical compounds there could be. And it turns out it's very hard to do. And I think there's one estimate that restricts it to a few elements. So if you say, OK, how many compounds of these five or six common elements are there in combination? And even there, you know, the estimate was, you know, in the millions. So it's, it, I don't think that even if we restrict ourselves to those very sort of paradigmatic areas, we will end up with a, you know, small satisfying number of kinds. Uh, I think that there's uh, many more kinds than we've been inclined to think there are. And now, you might say the, the question of, of sort of sparsity and density is not one about absolute number, but somehow about, you know, how prevalent they, they are in any particular domain, how dense they are, as it were. Um, and I think that's really kind of hard to talk about. I mean, I, I did say something earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, earlier about how I think in some domains, there's lots of different ways we can sort of carve up the the beast to use plato's terminology here it, and it's not just that we can carve it any which way we, we please it's just that there are lots of joints and some joints might be more interesting to us than others or more tractable to us but that's not to say that there aren't other kinds in the vicinity that we could have focused on and it seems as though yes in in certain domains in the social domain uh there are we have more leeway or there are more options uh, to see, you know, to, uh, of, of where to uh, draw distinctions and which kinds of clusters of properties to, to isolate. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's something that's very hard to quantify. And I think that even people who have thought of kinds as being a very privileged a set of distinctions or, or uh, patterns in the world have, you know, have more, are implicitly committed to there being many more kinds than they might have assumed. Right. I mean, do, do you think there might be like an extreme infinitely many kinds or is that sort of uh, not well, possible? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know about infinite, but I mean, it is true that in some domains, kinds are constantly being created. I mean, kinds are maybe also passing out of existence. But if you think of the biological domain, new species are coming into being. In the social domain, new social configurations, new types of institutions, new types of uh, social groups are coming into being. And so at least potentially it's open-ended if the universe is around, you know, then yeah, potentially you can have an infinite number of kinds that way. But, you know, as for like the, you know, at, at any current moment, I think you, one would have to say that there's a finite number of kinds, although it's a, it's a vast number. Right. This is something that doesn't come up. I don't think in the, in, in the element, but what do you think about the, like empty or fictional kinds. Are there kinds that just never have any instances, but, you know, they could have, like, I don't know, other species that there could be, maybe unicorns or, or what are fictional kinds, like, you know, witches and, or Bigfoot, you know, cryptozoological kinds. Are these genuine kinds or, or no? Or what do you think? I mean, there are certain kinds of uh, causal structures that could be instantiated, but 
don't happen to be. So sure, I mean, if if things had gone differently, there might have been different biological species. There's also, you know, one apparently, you know, we don't really know how many stable chemical elements there might be. I mean, scientists are constantly trying, you know, to the, the so-called transuranic elements, the elements beyond uranium. And in the lab, people will sometimes you know, for a brief nanosecond, create three atoms of some element that is, you know, has very high atomic number. And I think nuclear physicists talk about sort of islands of stability uh, when it comes to chemical elements. So, yeah, I mean, there are those kinds of potential kinds that don't happen to be instantiated. I mean, for all we know, maybe there are some elements beyond uranium in the sort of 120 uh, atomic number range that have never been instantiated in the universe and may never be, but maybe potentially they could be if we, if the conditions were right and we, you know, were firing things at each other and creating these things that could be stable for very, very tiny fractions of a second. Um, I think, I, I mean, I'm not particularly exercised about those. I think one reason you might be exercised about them is something that I touched on in the in the element but didn't go into, is the whole debate about whether kinds are universals, whether they correspond to universals or whether they're just uh, collections of individuals. So in other words, whether you're a nominalist or a universalist or a metaphysical realist, you know, kind of a realist with a capital R about kinds. And I think of that debate as being somewhat orthogonal to the first order debate about, you know, realism about kinds, you know, whether there are such things in the world. Uh, There's this additional question, okay, if there are such things in the world, do they correspond to something that is a a metaphysical universal over and above the, the members of that kind? Or is the kind just members? And if you are a universalist and think that there is something that corresponds to the kind itself, whether it's some kind of transcendent platonic form or an imminent universal, the kinds of universals that, say, David Armstrong tended to posit that are imminent in things and and are wholly present in each individual instance. So if you think that there are those kinds of universals, then if, then if there are these kind of potential kinds that don't happen to come into existence, yeah, maybe you have a population of uninstantiated universals in your, in your metaphysics. And, you know, if you're, if you're kind of a sparse metaphysician, uh, that might be a bit of an embarrassment. But I guess I, I haven't really spent too many hours being kept up awake at night thinking about uninstantiated kinds or kinds that could come into existence, just haven't actually. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, 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 like if we think that a species correspond to kinds, like I, I might want to say that, look, evolution could have played out differently. There could have been different species. There could have been different kinds of animals. You know, I, I don't know. I think in the usual sense, we would count those possibilities or, you know, as, as kinds, but I don't know, maybe. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, it, they do play a role in our theorizing and our scientific inquiries. So there's some speculations about things like, well, if the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct, would mammals have evolved or would, you know, mammals have really proliferated the way they, they did? And if not, what sorts of dinosaur species might have evolved uh, as, a, you know, if, uh, if that is extinction event had not happened. And that can sometimes be informative if you start sort of playing the, replaying the tape of life and imagining certain kinds of counterfactual scenarios. Uh, you can gain some insight into what sorts of things are biologically feasible and what sorts of things aren't biologically feasible and so on. So I think, though, you know, speculating about what if kinds can sometimes be informative in, in biology, but also in other kinds of areas. So I don't think it's a completely idle exercise to think about those hypothetical kinds. <laughs>
Right. Okay. So another thing I wanted to cover, which is that, I mean, so far we've been thinking about natural kinds as applying to things, well, to things, to like objects, entities, individuals in the world. But as you, as you note in the, in the element, maybe we should think of kinds as being about other aspects of reality too, like, you know, functions and dispositions and, um, and other things like that. I mean, yeah. I mean, could you, could you talk a bit more about this and, and, uh, why there might be other things captured as kinds? Yeah, I think that when we, you know, this is part of what I was thinking about the beginning when uh, I was saying, you know, we've been fed an, a small diet or one-sided diet of examples. And I think the ones that figure most prominently are the ones, are kinds of uh, of objects or kinds of individuals, you know, spatially defined, you know, temporal, you know, temporal continuance. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in our inquiries into the world, we do posit other uh, types of things, things that fall into other ontological categories, such as, you know, as you mentioned, processes, capacities, functions, uh, events, and so on. So there are various sciences that talk about capacities or mechanisms or or uh, events and so on. And I think there's no reason in principle why we also shouldn't think of kinds of those things. So there are kinds of processes such as the process of photosynthesis or the process of oxidization or the process of ionization or something like that. So I think that we uh, certainly, I mean, if we're interested in metaphysics and philosophy of science, we should think about what sorts of features those kinds of things have. And I'm also a pluralist about this. I mean, I'm, if it turns out that some sciences, you know, need to posit such things as, you know, events and processes and capacities, then I'm, you know, see no reason why not to admit those into our ontology and to think of them as coming in kinds. So, you know, I, I recently wrote a book on cognitive ontology and in cognitive science, capacities loom pretty large. You know, people talk about the capacity of, of episodic memory or the capacity of face recognition or capacity of language that humans have. And I think that those, it, I don't see a way of sort of explaining those away or reducing them to some other ontological category. And I think it's useful to think of them as coming in kinds and thinking about what sorts of features kinds of capacities might have, as opposed to kinds of states or kinds of functions or, or something like that. And, you know, occasionally metaphysicians, I think, have this kind of hegemonic view of trying to reduce let's say, to everything to process. So you have these process ontologists and say, no, let's not talk about objects. They're actually processes, right? And, you know, if you're clever, maybe you can find a way of putting everything, all talk, all discourse about objects in, into discourse or talk about processes. Uh, I think that's a little artificial and we're uh, being sort of unduly maybe restrictive in doing that kind of thing. And so I think that we should just allow, uh, help ourselves to whatever we find indispensable in our theorizing when it comes to ontological categories. Yeah, for sure. And then, and then, but what, I mean, sort of along those lines though, what, what if someone thinks that say some of these categories aren't really real? I mean, like, I know, put it one way, we might think that Say process, you know, in the reverse of what you were saying, maybe we think that pro there aren't really processes. I mean, but that's just a way of talking about changes to certain things over time. Um, if someone took that view, would that rule out thinking about processes as a, a kinds or thinking of good kinds of processes, or or not? Because they can still think, well, it's still maybe a useful way of talking about the changes to those things over time, even if processes aren't strictly speaking real. I mean. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, I, I think that if we need certain kinds of metaphysical categories to best explain and understand and generalize and so on, 
then that's the best argument for thinking that those things are real. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm with Quine on this, right? To be is to be the value of a variable. If we find that we are hard pressed to make sense of the world without positing uh, entities that fall into those ontological categories, then I think we should just help ourselves to them. Now, you know, maybe in certain cases we find, no, actually, this is sort of otios or, you know, talking about mechanisms is not really necessary because you can do everything that you were supposed you were able to do with mechanisms just by talking about entities and activities organized in a certain way but it just seems as though in some domains it's unavoidable to posit mechanisms and talk about how these mechanisms fit together and what sorts of kinds they belong to and how they you know what sorts of causal uh, processes they enter into and so on. So I guess I'm I'm a bit uh, more relaxed about about allowing these kinds of things into our ontology if it turns out that they really do some epistemic work for us. Right. Although these <laughs> issues in in ontology and ontological commitment is a whole other kind of worms. Uh, right. Okay. So another thing at the, at the start. I mentioned, I mean, we talked about thinking about natural kinds as these sort of non-arbitrary categories of nature, um, but this might be a, it's a little bit mysterious. I mean, wh what do we mean by arbitrary or non-arbitrary here? Does it have something to do with like projectability and their use in like induction or, or that they aren't like merely a matter of just stipulation or convention or does it mean thing that they capture like clusters of properties, the things that seem to come together? Um, more often, I mean, what do you what do you think? No, I think that's a that's a really deep question, and and I think what you said is is really on the right track. In other words, that what we mean by arbitrary, a arbitrary category or arbitrary class, is one where what you see is what you get. Like there's nothing more to it than the label. There's nothing more to it than the name, and. By contrast, a non-arbitrary one is where there are these features of the world that tend to cluster together. So you're, you're capturing some kind of structure in the world. You're, you're capturing a pattern. You're looking at a certain property, and that's leading you to some other property, uh, which is leading you to some other property. So there are these things that hang together in the world, and we're looking at what, what are these features of the world that hang together. And that's what's enabling us to project, as you said. So yeah, projectability is our guide because if we can project for, I don't know, this fruit is ripe to this fruit is sweet, right? That's getting us something. So we know that when a fruit is ripe, it's going to be sweet. Now, of course, that's not an exceptionalist generalization, but those things kind of start hanging together. And of course, you can you can also project from this fruit is sweet to this fruit is ripe to some extent, but we also want the causal order. So we want to know, are we projecting from A to B and from B to A? We might be projecting from A to B, but also from B to A, but we want to know, is A causing B or is B causing A? And so when we're trying to capture the kinds, when we're trying to find certain properties that are not arbitrary, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find those properties that are linked to other properties. And by contrast, the arbitrary properties are ones just that just are not. So philosophers like to kind of spew these out ad nauseum, you know, things that were born on Tuesday or, you know, things that are three meters from my nose are green or round things, right? Those are all properties where they don't indicate anything else. They, you can't project from them to anything else. Uh, and so projectability is our guide to the things that stick together in the universe, the structures of the universe, right? And I think that structure is a causal structure. So what we're ultimately interested in capturing is, is a causal structure of the world. And the kinds are precisely those features of the causal structure of the world that we're trying to 
uh, discern. So yeah, arbitrary is, I think, the contrast class because arbitrary means that uh, the, the property that we're picking out here is not linked to anything else. It's, a, it's just a kind of a, a cog that's not moving anything else. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then sort of at the, earlier on, we, you mentioned essentialist theories and how they've been and remain somewhat popular in thinking about mm-hmm. kinds and, and just other issues in, in, in philosophy and metaphysics, but you're, and you and other people are, are becoming more pessimistic of them. Can you talk a bit more about how such theories work and why you think they're probably not right? <laughs> Yeah, so essentialism, you know, as maybe many people in philosophy know, has had a bit of a revival in the last 40, 50 years or so. But there's also been, I think, a bit of a turning away from it in recent years. And I think the the way I understand essentialism is it also thinks of natural kinds as clusters of properties, but it puts some very strict restrictions on which clusters of properties count. So uh, one, I think, very central tenet of essentialism is that the clusters of properties have to cluster in such a way that they're necessary and sufficient for uh, instantiating the kind. In other words, you can't be a member of the kind unless you have some requisite set of properties. If you have this set, then willy-nilly you are, it's sufficient. And if you don't have this set, then you aren't. So they're necessary. And I think that as a matter of fact, there are very few kinds. If we're interested in you know, understanding how the universe works, it rarely works that way. It's rarely the case that the properties cluster together so strictly and so tightly. It's more often the case that properties cluster in a much kind of looser way. And so this insistence on sort of necessary and sufficient conditions having the essence, the, the requisite property that is both or set of properties that's both necessary and sufficient for being a member of that kind, I think is too restrictive. The other thing that many essentialists, I think that's a very sort of central tenet of essentialism. Many essentialists also tend to privilege intrinsic properties. They think that for uh, uh, real kinds, you have to have properties that are intrinsic to their members. You can't have relational properties or functional properties. So the properties have to be inherent in the in the individual itself that's a member of the kind. Sometimes also they restrict it further by saying they have to be microstructural. So they have to pertain to the underlying you know, chemical constituents. So if it's a chemical compound, what individuates the kind is, is its chemical formula or something like that. And you have to drill down to the sort of a microstructure in order to, to know what uh, makes the kind the kind it is. Uh, they also often, and this is something that is, I think, played a big, big role in essentialist thinking uh, and maybe is as central as the necessary and sufficient condition. It's the condition of modal necessity. So they think of these kinds as pertaining, uh, or as these properties, these these essences, as pertaining to the kind in every possible world. So it's not just that gold happens to have the atomic number 79. Sorry. Ah, that's my phone. It's not that it just happens to be the case that gold has the atomic number 79. In this world, that would be the case in every possible world or in every counterfactual situation. And I just find those claims very, very difficult to assess. And I think they rest a lot on intuitions. You know, what would be or would not be gold in some other possible world? You could, you know, philosophers love to spin these kinds of scenarios. Uh, And I, I don't think we have very stable intuitions. And I don't think it really, I don't think it does any real work for us to posit that these properties are are modally uh, necessary or, or hold across possible worlds. So anyway, I, I think uh, I and many other philosophers have become more skeptical about essentialism and about why uh, the natural kinds uh, for the, 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 they have to have essences, in other words, properties that are 
characterized in in these four ways that I that I just mentioned. So I I think that um, yeah I, I think that a lot of philosophers of science, especially, have pushed back to, against essentialism in recent years. Right. I definitely definitely share that reaction. Like, I don't think that. Um, I mean, all these things that we might count as kinds, like the various biological kinds, I just don't think they're going to admit of these like necessary and sufficient, you know, conditions and properties for being of that kind, you know, and actually that sort of gets me to the, another thing I wanted to bring up, which is that, I mean, you discuss it also a bit in the book, which is vagueness. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, I'm a big fan of vagueness. I think, I think the right response to vagueness is to recognize that there are these, it's a, there's fairly widespread indeterminacy in the extension and ap- applicability of various like terms um, and, and predicates. And, and I think this is true for many things we might call kinds too. Like if species correspond to kinds, uh, for example, I don't think like they, they generally have some pre- like precise first member or origin. There may even be vagueness as to whether some grouping counts as a kind, you know, is, is it <laughs> non-arbitrary enough? Like it might not be quite clear. And so I'm like, uh, do you agree with this? Does it sound right to you? I mean, uh, and, and do you think that these sort of issues undermine more realist med- medical views about kinds or, or, or not? No, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think that in many domains that where one kind starts and the other begins is sometimes a fuzzy matter. And yes, speciation is a is a very nice and important case where where a species, you know, when one species turns into an, another species, I think there's often a really gray area as to where one species ends and the other species begins. So I think we just find that there are lots of configurations in the universe where we aren't able to draw very strict lines. And I think that, yeah, a lot of um, early work on kinds, and I, you know, mentioned Mill and Hewell uh, earlier. Uh, I think Mill especially thought that you had to have. Uh, I think he talks about he uses the metaphor of a chasm rather than a ditch. He says there, there has to be a chasm between kinds uh, rather than a, a kind of a ditch. But I think that's just not borne out. I, I think there are lots of places where it turns out that there there are a lot of there, there isn't a very sharp cutoff. And I think there's a couple of ways, I mean, there's, there's a couple of ways of, of seeing this. I mean, one, one is to think about threshold effects. You know, there are certain, you know, changes in a certain quantity, which at a certain point uh, reaches a kind of tipping point and certain effects ensue, but there isn't a very sharp cutoff. It might be, you know, a, a kind of gradual and so, and, 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 you know, if you think of what biologists think of as fitness landscapes, uh, you can find local maxima in a fitness landscape, and that's not sharply distinguished from the uh, kinds of, you know, the, the values of the properties that are closely adjacent to that particular maxima in, in or that particular maximum in the, in the fitness landscape. So I think there are certainly lots of areas in the universe where there aren't sharp cutoffs and where kinds uh, don't correspond to, or you can't sort of draw a very clean line between where one kind starts and the, and the other uh, stops. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. And then, okay. What would you say is, I mean, this is sort of, (laughs) um, sort of been, Getting close to this already, but I mean, what, what on your view is the best account then of a natural kinds on offer? Um, if there is one, how would you? <laughs> I mean, I, I think I've already given the game away in, in some, you know, in, at least implicitly. I mean, I've I've called it following Carl Craver um, mentioned this in a 2009 paper uh, without really spelling it out in great detail, but he alluded to the possibility of having a simple causal theory of kinds, he called it. And what he had in mind was uh, something like Boyd's theory. I mean, Boyd's theory posits that these properties that we've been talking about as clustering together, uh, Boyd says that 
when you have a natural kind, you have a mechanism that keeps the properties uh, in a state of equilibrium. And I think uh, some people think that that's a bit too restrictive. Properties can cluster together, but without there necessarily being anything like a mechanism that keeps those properties in a state of equilibrium or homeostasis. So rather than just then posit this very complex kind of particular causal uh, structure as underlying all kinds, I think it's simpler to say, look, there is some causal connection between the properties that cluster together in kinds, but it need not take any particular form. And actually, Boyd himself, I think sometimes when he's presenting his account, he says either there's a mechanism that pre uh, keeps the properties in equilibrium or there's some other kind of causal relation between the properties. And I think that latter uh, way of putting it is, is the right way, because I think if we find, if we look at the categories that do epistemic work for us, what they correspond to are certain kinds of causal structures in the world, but they need not be uh, homeostatic property clusters. So I think that the count, the count that works best, that seems to fit the you know the cases best is just a simple causal theory that says that you know there the there are these causal connections between properties and they could be i mean there's sort of lots of um this additional complexity here because those properties need not be intrinsic. They can be relational. So you have these functional kinds, which pertain to the ways in which certain entities play a role in a larger system. Uh, you can have historical causal relations. So sometimes what we're interested in is in tracing his causal history. So in, in the book, I talk about etiological kinds or kinds that are based more on causal history than on synchronic causal powers. Or something like that. So, but I think the the common thread, the the common thread that runs through all these cases, is some kind of causal connection between the properties. Good, right? I, and this isn't an element on on causation, but I could see, you know, of course, causation is a huge can of worms in its own right. And I wonder, I don't know. I mean, that's you can have very different views on that. I mean, I, I, I don't know how important is thinking about. The nature of causation to you th for thinking about kinds. Yeah, I mean, I think it is true that causation is a very fraught concept, and there's lots of metaphysical questions. And so, in some sense, this account is just passing the buck. It's just saying, you want to know what natural kinds are? Well, they're grounded in causation. And you want to know what causation is? Ask the people who, who worry about causation. But I mean, having said that, I, I wanted to make like two two points to to make it seem like this isn't a complete cop out. One is I think causation is very fundamental. I mean, I think it's a it's a, a concept that is at the root of so much of our theorizing about a great deal, many things. You know, whether it's morality or free will or you know even knowledge or meaning and reference and so on. Uh, so it's kind of this very linchpin of a lot of philosophical theorizing. But the other thing about causation is, in some sense, it's not mysterious because we have very robust empirical ways of distinguishing causal relations from mere correlations. In fact, you might say a great deal of science is just about that. You know, what is causal and what is just correlational? And what is the direction of causality? So in many domains of science, that's exactly what we're trying to understand. So causation, in some sense, is a very tractable notion empirically. We know what sorts of technique or we have lots of techniques for uh, determining what causes what and what the order of causation is and distinguishing causation from correlation and so on. And so I think by, by rooting the kinds in, in causation, uh, in some sense, we're making them more tractable. We're making the question of uh, what are the natural kinds in this domain really reducible to the question is of what are the causal structures in this domain? And I think that's, you know, some kind of progress. 
what counts as progress in philosophy anyway. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. I don't. I don't want to suggest that it's not that it's sort of an empty account, right? But uh, yeah, you know, I agree. To some degree, we 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 understand roughly what we're getting at when we're talking about causation. But uh, yeah, we still might wonder how to think about that more precisely. But, but that's a different project, I guess. <laughs> um, I did. I did want to sort of roughly state how I'm how I think about natural kinds, and maybe get your thoughts on that. So you think? So yeah. I, I prefer to first think about like, I don't know, the actual thought and talk of which we engage, what we maybe have in mind. You know, we have these terms like natural kinds and kinds and so on. And as far as I can tell, that, that gets used to talk about, you know, various categories and types of categories. And as we use these terms, like what what's relevant to counting as a quote unquote kind might, you know, vary a bit across both domain and context. Um, and it's sometimes more or less well-defined, more or less, you know, principled. We can draw generalities about kinds in this sense, you know, in certain contexts and perhaps in general. And it might be that some account of thinking of kinds as involving clusters of causally regulated properties or something like this is a decent model. Um, at least sometimes I wouldn't want to take the model too seriously because I'm not really thinking about this as some sort of I don't know, metaphysical category. I kind of see my approach as fairly conventionalist and that it's primarily a matter of how we, you know, decide to carve up things and, you know, what we tend to include as quote unquote kinds as we use the word. And um, that's kind of it in a way. I don't know. This is a very brief description, but how does it sound to you? I think maybe I'm a bit more realist than that because I think in many instances we do want to, I mean, I think a lot of uh, debates in science turn on what the right way to classify a certain domain is and what what is not a good way of classifying that domain. Now, <clears throat> some of those questions, I think, can uh, are, are really more a matter of which of the different right ways of classifying are we more interested in? Uh, but sometimes, you know, there are ways of classifying that turn out just not to be right, uh, that turn out to be wrong. And I think, you know, something like the four humors or the four elements or, you know, so um, I think that we want, we want some way of, being able to weed out those kinds of categories or saying what about them is misleading or doesn't really capture the domain very faithfully. You know, and as I said before, I think where convention enters into it is more in deciding which ones we want to privilege in, uh, privilege or which ones we want to put more time and effort in or something like that. So I guess I want to make distinction, a sort of preliminary distinction between the the classifications that get something right and the classifications that just don't. And then once we've got the ones that, that get something right, I think there's, there's room for saying, okay, which of these ones are we going to put the time and effort into investigating or into, you know, doing more experiments with or theorizing about more or something like that. Now, I mean, <coughs> You know, if, if at the end of the day you say, oh, yes, but all of these ones that we think are right are just convenient fictions or instruments, they enable us to get by or something, you know, that's a very sort of, I think, baseline metaphysical stance. And my attitude to that, and I've maybe already hinted at this a couple of times, is that, look, what, be what more do we have to go by when it comes to what's out there or, or the structure of reality is what, you know, what bakes our bread and washes our clothes and so on. And I think that, you know, it might be good to have a position of epistemic modesty and say, you know, I'm not saying that this is the ultimate, but I think we don't have a better guide to what the ultimate is than those categories that, uh, do do those do that kind of work for us yeah that, that's fair i mean i guess i guess i'm just sort of biased into thinking that i don't know i don't view the world as sort of 
with joints already, so to speak. There's just different ways we might think and talk about it. Some, you know, may have more quote unquote theoretical virtues than others. You know, they may enable more simple, more comprehensive description, whatever. Um, but apart from that, and I kind of see those as, well, either issues of accuracy or pragmatics and not about which carvings are legitimate or illegitimate, except in those sense that we might care about, you know? Um, so I don't know, this is maybe just a bias of my own, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I can see if, if you think that you take an alternative view about what reality, the basic structure of reality is like, then yeah, I mean, there, maybe there are these, these kinds corresponding to the, the real <laughs> the metaphysical differences in the world. I don't know if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. I don't <laughs> I don't know how to resolve that, but uh, I don't know. Does that seem fair? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess I think it's good and healthy always to have a good dose of epistemic modesty and say we might be proved wrong. But the thing that's going to prove us wrong is not some deity handing us down the real map of the world and saying, you know, this is what it was really out there. But, you know, our continuing investigations and and our revising what we once thought, we, where we once thought we glommed onto causal structure, and then it turned out we didn't. So in that sense, I mean, I think epistemic modesty is fine and good. I just don't think that there's this kind of veil that we might one day, you know, uncover, or, or that there's this kind of in principle obstacle to finding out what's really out there kind of thing, you know? Right. Oh, actually, but something you said that reminded me of something that I thought about, but I mean, you talk about using science as, as a kind of best guide for thinking about, about natural kinds, but what about things that, um, like deities or maybe other things that we might think exist or at least could exist that aren't investi- investigatable by science, really, maybe like, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, angels or whatever that, that could exist. Do those correspond to kinds as well? How do how would we even approach that? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I just think that those things that we have no means of investigating, we just should be silent about <laughs> paraphrase Wittgenstein again. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that, you know, it, it can play a role sometimes, you know, as we were talking about earlier, positing hypothetical kinds or imagining what kinds there could have been had the tape of life been played differently or something like that. And I think that, that that's a useful exercise. I mean, it's a useful exercise both in terms of our theorizing and our epistemic endeavors, but also our imaginative endeavors. I mean, I think uh, many people, I myself included, get a kick out of thinking about, you know, well, science fictional kinds, you know, kinds that that are conjured up in very elaborate uh, exercises in world making. So I think that's all very well and good, but those aren't the sorts of things that uh, I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about, you know, what are the real kinds and how we determine what the real kinds are. Right. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, Sounds good. Obviously there's a lot more that I could ask about this, but I I do want to end with, I like to end with a kind of general metaphilosophical question. So I mean, what do you think is the, value of philosophy why is it worth doing what's what's good about philosophy maybe to you or more broadly i mean take it how you want i guess i guess you know if i were to try and um pick out one thing it's getting us to question things that we took for granted right or or as as some students will say in essays took for granted right and i think maybe that's a better that's a better locution th- those things that you think are solid that you uh thought of as being rock bottom it turns they're just you know thin air right and i think that's part of the pleasure of teaching philosophy is to expose students to ideas that shake things up for them or get them to question things that they thought were, you know, unquestionable or axiomatic or something like that. And I think that's really as much, and I think philosophy does that, you know, I think other disciplines do it too, but we, I think, make a habit of it maybe more than other disciplines. And I think that 
that's very much necessary in the contemporary world. I think academic freedom is is always under threat, and we need to be vigilant to protect our ability to shake things up in that way and to get people out of their comfort zone and to ask questions that make people uncomfortable and maybe um, get them to rethink their priorities in life and so on. I used to teach an introductory course called The Meaning of Life, which, you know, when I first was asked to teach this, you know, I think of myself as being a sort of a philosopher of science and so on. I thought, how am I going to teach this meaning of life? That's so wishy-washy. But, you know, it really made me appreciate. It was a literature that I embarrassed to say I'd never really immersed myself in. Uh, But I found that both for me and for students, it got them to question all kinds of things about how they should live their lives and what sort, what priorities they should have and so on. And I just found that very, very ref- unsettling, but refreshingly unsettling. Yeah, it's a, a good answer. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we find that something we think that something's rock bottom, but then we can raise it to the ground, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. All right. I think I think that's that's very good. And the question is there, but it's been it's been really great. It's been really great having you, Professor Khalidi. Or Khalidi, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for your interest. And I hope we can chat again sometime. <laughs>